White Ride by The Clash. I've never ever introduced a data science event to White Ride by The Clash. So there we are, there's a first. So hello, I'm uh, Paul Watson. It's a privilege to direct the National Innovation Center for Data. Um, that's because we do really interesting work with lots of organizations, but being director also allows me to do some key things like tell you that the toilets are out of this door, you turn left and they're behind reception. And we're not expecting a fire alarm, but if there is one, then we go out of that door there, or you can go out the back door and through the main, through the main entrance. So we're really excited to see so many people. Thank you so much for coming for this, for this event. Um, the National Innovation Centre for Data was set up by the government and Newcastle University uh, in order to address this issue that we saw, which is that lots of organisations, be the private sector organisations or public sector organisations, are drowning in data. And they can see the potential for transforming what they do to get more insights into their operations, to launch new data-driven products and services. But the problem is that, in the main, they don't have the skills to do that. So we have a team of data scientists, you'll see some of them this afternoon, who work with companies on collaborative projects. And the, the way in which we work is that the aim is not just to deliver some new service or some new product, but also to transfer skills in that organization so that the staff of that organization become empowered and they can identify and realize new opportunities. And we've run about 80 of these projects over the last four years, and we think we've got a model that works. So if you are interested in talking to us about working together, then do come and see me afterwards or any of the any of the team. Now today's um, event is of course on generative AI and one of the exciting things about running a National in Innovation Centre for Data is not just the range of organisations we get to work with but the fact that every few months there's something new and interesting comes along that we have to understand and then if we can harness it we can use it when we work with with organisations. We can transfer those new skills into these organisations. And generative AI has been perhaps the classic example of this because I think that a year ago, if we'd advertised an event on generative AI, nobody would have turned up because nobody would have known, known what it was. But now, of course, every time you turn the, the news on, there's some headline about it. Um, a particular low point for me came when I was woken up by my wife from a sound sleep at midnight, three days before I was due to give a lecture on AI because she, she didn't want me to miss out on the fact that the main headline on the BBC Radio 4 Midnight News was from Jeff Hinton and it was about ChatGPT3 and some of the terrible things that might happen uh, if we unleash this on the, uh, on the world. But uh, so as well as all these exciting potential of this new sort of technology, there's also a lot of hype that goes with it. And so what we wanted to do was uh, before we have a panel discussion on it, and I'm sure you've got some questions to ask, and if you haven't, start to think about those questions. Mm -hmm. But before that, it's a pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Mac, Mac Zuria. And Mac is one of our data science team. He's got a PhD in data science, and he's been doing some work on large language models. You may have seen his blog, which I think is the most popular blog that we've published. So that, again, shows the, the excitement in this. So I'll hand over to, to Mac. Well, thank you all for coming. It's much appreciated. Thank you so much, Paul, as well. So, yeah, in my short talk, I just wanted to sort of talk about the three things. So the sort of theory, so how did we get to where we are? The reality, so how an organization can actually implement some of this Gen AI stuff and what a future might hold as well. But before I wanted to start, I just wanted to have a quick slide about myself. So as Paul mentioned, I have a PhD in statistics. I joined uh, NICD uh, two years ago. I work as a, a data scientist uh, specializing in all uh, things uh, statistics and machine learning related. I'm particularly interested in two things, which is AI assurance and large language models. And I wanted to uh, apologize just for my picture as well. As you can see, I've weathered, I've aged quite a lot. <laughs> so I decided to perhaps use some of those Gen AI models to actually update my profile picture, as I didn't have enough cash to obviously fund another uh, uh, photographer. So here's just a few uh, attempts. 
So the very first one is me looking like a cool looking anime character, which works okay. Uh, the second one is me as a Mona Lisa, which I don't think it even looks like me. I think it looks more like my colleague Peter over there. Uh, and then finally, there's me as a cute looking teddy bear. And I think this is going to be my new profile picture going forwards. So yeah, as I must sort of mentioned, I'm a data scientist, but I fully anticipate to become a prompt engineer in the future. And I will talk about it in more detail later on. So I wanted to talk about the theory. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of uh, 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 yeah, misunderstanding as to what certain things are and what certain things are not. So I wanted to sort of clarify a few definitions and then uh, essentially talk about some of the key breakthroughs that uh, allowed us to get to where we are. So first of all, I thought they would be useful to sort of define a few key terms, such as AI, machine learning, and deep learning. Uh, I felt compelled to do so because I think a lot of these terms are used sort of interchangeably, whereas they sort of mean slightly different things. So I, I felt like it would be useful to um, sort of, I'm a visual person, so I thought it would be useful to perhaps sort of see the hierarchy of these terms. And obviously, if you want to look at hierarchies, I think the best way to, to visualize it is with a babushka doll or a Russian doll. So as you can see, we get AI, which is essentially a field, and then it has a, a variety of different subfields. So in terms of AI, I mean, a lot of people would say that it's a reasonably new field. One of the uh, sort of very first uh, definitions is by this guy called John McCarthy, one of the fathers of AI. And it defines AI as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. And I think that's quite a good definition, but it is rather circular, because obviously it has intelligence in it. So I thought, OK, maybe perhaps I can look at some other definitions. So the next one, I thought, maybe let's check out our friends at the European Commission. So they actually have a quite long convoluted definition of AI, which is, I'm not even going to uh, repeat it. I think it has too many words. I think it has a lot of terms which are sort of conflated, like prediction and recommendation. And it sort of focuses too much on uh, yeah, uh, things which are to do with, with, with those matters, <laughs> predictions and stuff. So then I thought maybe Google will do a, a better job. Um, but again, I think this definition focuses too much on the sort of data si side of things. So the, def the best definition I've managed to find is by Stuart Russell. So Stuart Russell defines AI rather cleanly as anything to do with building machines that do the right thing, that act in ways that can be expected to achieve their objectives. And I think this is quite a broad definition which captures a variety of different things like learning systems um, and robotics. So I think this is a quite clean definition of AI. The next thing to do would be to define machine learning. And I don't think it gets any better than a definition by Tom Mitchell. He says the machine learning has to have three key components. First of all, you need to have a task. Then you need to have some sort of experience. And then you need to have a performance measure. And essentially, the aim of the game is to get better at your task with some sort of experience that you have as measured by P. And this definition is very broad, and it actually captures a variety of different things. So under that definition, uh, an autonomous vehicle could be a type of machine learning problem. Here, for example, a task could be something like driving on a motorway. Training would be your sequence of images and steering commands. And then performance measure would be the average distance before you have an error or a crash. Uh, another one would be something that maybe perhaps other people are more familiar with, which is sort of data analytics, text. So for example, another task could be something like sentiment analysis of social media, Twitter posts. Uh, training would be, you know, your data set of social media post posts uh, together with the labels. And then the performance measure would be something like accuracy of actually classifying your sentiment. Um, so that's essentially machine learning definition. I think it's quite a good one. Thank you, Tom Mitchell. Uh, now, when it came to writing these slides, I got a little bit tired. So I obviously 
as it is very cliched, I enlisted the help of ChatGPT to, to, to help me with the definition of deep learning. It did a reasonable job, you know, it defined it as a subfield of machine learning, which is good. But I don't think it was as clean as a definition of Jan LeCun, one of the fathers of deep learning. So he defines deep learning as anything to do with constructing neural networks, which are considered to be mathematical approximations of a brain, and training them using gradient-based optimization. So I think that's essentially as clean as it gets. It's a type of machine learning where we use neural networks. Now I just wanted to have a very quick diversion. So I wanted to talk about two different type of models that we typically encounter in machine learning and deep learning. So typically we can actually classify our models as either discriminative or generative. So a discriminative model typically just learns the decision boundary. So it just approximates the conditional probability y given x. So it learns the sort of mapping between your inputs and labels. So you can't really do uh, anything uh, like generating data from that type of a model. And discriminative models are models which have been very popular over the last few decades. When you think about logistic regression, when you think about random forest classifiers, that sort of stuff, that all fund, uh, falls under that sort of type of discriminative model. A generative model does things slightly differently. Rather than just learning the decision boundary, it tries to learn the probability distributions of the underlying data. So by doing so, you get a slightly richer representation. Now, I think generative models are pretty cool, and obviously they've been getting more and more prominence, but that concept has been around for quite some time. And I think generative models are slightly different to Gen AI. And this is essentially my next slide. So in my view, not all generative models are Gen AI. In order for a model to be a Gen AI, you need to generate new content, which is an unstructured way. So it needs to be content which is unstructured data. So Gen AI is a generative model which generates either a natural or a programming language, an image, a video, or an audio. So if your generative model outputs a number, a label, or a probability, and that's it, to me, that's not Gen AI, and Google seems to agree with that. So I think that's essentially as far as it goes with our definitions. However, it's also important to cover a very important concept, which is foundation models. So foundation models is a term that has been sort of, uh, I think, first coined by Stanford University in 2021. And it actually describes a, a broader paradigm shift in the AI research. So previously, the focus was on developing task-specific models, which have been trained on narrow data. So the focus previously was on training, say, a hot dog classifier or a banana classifier. Now the focus for us is to develop multi-purpose models, which are trained on broad data. And as you can see from that figure, that broad data could be code, images, text, et cetera, et cetera. And the aim of the game is to get a, a model which sort of captures a broader understanding of the world and then perhaps adapt it later on for a specific task. Um, and then, obviously, a lot of people have been talking about large language models. And uh, those models, to me, are a subset of foundation models that deal with just text. So they generate text and they address uh, text-specific tasks. So those tasks could be something like sentiment analysis, it could be something like named entity recognition, et cetera, et cetera. So not all foundation models have to be Gen AI, so they don't necessarily have to be generative in nature. So a, a good example of that would be a BERT. Uh, BERT is a transformer model uh, created in 2018. It's a foundation model because uh, it can uh, uh, essentially deal with a variety of different natural language uh, processing tasks, but it can't generate new content. So not all Gen AI are foundation models and vice versa. So in terms of Gen AI, I think it all sort of kicked off in 2014 with the variational autoencoder, which was a very important model. 
Recently, the focus has uh, been on developing models which are either transformer-based or stable diffusion-based, or merging them together to create a multimodal models. So, yeah, the vast majority of these models will be of, of, of those two forms. Uh, and the reason why Gen AI has been so successful and captured the attention of so many people, I think, is due to three key breakthroughs. So the very first breakthrough is self-supervised learning. And it is a concept that goes back to the sort of uh, 1980s with the denoise and autoencoder. Uh, it was kind of revived by uh, uh, Yoshua Benjo in 2008, and then it really took off with the BERT paper in 2018. So here, the idea is that we can actually use input and input only to actually train the system. So with supervised learning, we typically need to have labels, and we need to have a set of inputs. Uh, with reinforcement learning, we need to have a reward or something like this. With self-supervised learning, all we need is essentially an input. And the idea is that we either reconstruct that input or we predict the missing parts of the input. So if you want to do causal language modeling, which is essentially how uh, GPT-based uh, GPT models are trained, all you have to do is uh, leave the last word out and try to predict it. So that's called causal language modeling. Uh, and you can also do mask language modeling if you want to train a bird type model, where you essentially just try to predict the random uh, word from your training corpus. And that's illustrated by this figure as well. So we essentially get input, we get some text, we mask out some words, and we try to predict it. The reason why that's such a successful technique is because it reduces the need for a human annotator. So we no longer require labels. And also by, for example, in the case of text, uh, in order to predict the missing word, we need to actually acquire the understanding of the language. So that was the very first key breakthrough which really kicked off this sort of Gen AI field. The second breakthrough was actually finding the promise in architectures. So in our case, um, we're talking about text. Um, transformers really have taken off. The reason why transformers are so successful is because of three things. They have this attention mechanism, which actually captures context between words. They're able to process sequences of words very well with positional encodings. And you can actually parallelize them very well. So um, that means that you can train them much more, uh, much more faster than, for example, recurrent neural networks. So. Um, if you do self-supervised learning with the right architecture, you can essentially scale up very well. And then the third sort of big breakthrough was a paper from 2020 by Kaplan, who said that if you scale up three things, which is compute, data, and model size, for transformer-based architectures, you get huge improvements in performance. And essentially, over the next sort of three years, that's what people have been doing. They've been scaling up model size. As you can see, we have now have models which are in the sort of trillions of parameters uh, with things like GPT-4. We've also scaled up data sets. So we've gone from uh, 3 billion tokens for BERT to 1.4 uh, trillion tokens for Chinchilla. And as you can see, the names of these models are getting more and more weird. Uh, yeah, I don't even know what chinchilla is. I think there's also alpaca these days. Yeah, it's pretty crazy stuff. So um, those three things, those three key breakthroughs, have actually created something very interesting, actually. So we've noticed that with really large models, we get these emergent abilities. So we actually get some sort of abilities which are not really observed for smaller models. So um, one of my favorite um, examples of emergence, because these three are rather dull, we're talking about arithmetic, adding up, I think, two-digit numbers. We're talking about middle, high school exams and word and context. 
my favorite example of emergence, after you see this wonderful GIF, is emoji movie. So it turns out that uh, some large language models are now able to uh, work out a movie title from an emoji sequence, which shows that they can do popular culture and they have contextual understanding of emojis. So it's actually very interesting. So I, I haven't seen Finding Nemo, and I've had many arguments with my girlfriend as to whether that sequence of emojis is actually the correct one, because she believed it should be just magnifying glass in one fish. Uh, but apparently, so actually on, on, on the GitHub for, for this um, uh, emoji test, um, they actually have the justification as to why they have three fishes and one uh, human. Apparently, it fits the plot better. So I'm going to trust them on that. So obviously, we have very powerful large language models. They do a lot of wonderful things. They are state of the art for a variety of different tasks, like guessing emojis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that doesn't necessarily make them very good assistants. So uh, as you can see, here's just a screenshot of uh, a completion uh, to a prompt by, uh, by GPT-3 model. And it doesn't do a very good job. You know, it just gives you frequent words, but it doesn't necessarily adhere to the sort of instruction, which is to explain the moon landing to a six-year-old. So in addition to um, being good at a variety of different tasks in order to be a good assistant, these models need to essentially follow instructions. They need to perform complex reasoning tasks. And they need to generalize to unseen instructions. And this is what the sort of latest research um, have been doing. So it turns out that if you grab a large language model, and if you actually fine tune it on tasks which are phrased as instructions, that enables the model to then follow instructions much better. It also improves its performance for zero short learning tasks, where we don't necessarily have any examples. So that research was very hot in about 2021, 2022. It also turned out that if you include not just natural language data in your training sets, if you include some code, um, you actually get a much better performance on complex reasoning tasks. So these days, the vast majority of these models will be trained with a considerable percentage of code in addition to natural language processing. The idea here is that if you, for example, learn how to do object-oriented programming, you're able to uh, break down a complex problem into smaller subsets of, of sub, uh, subtasks. Uh, people got quite excited about tree of thought prompting as well, so including intermediate steps towards solving the problem. That seems to also sort of nudge the language model into doing things which require complex reasoning. And then also in context learning is a thing. So if you give an example within your prompt of, of what is your input and what is your output, it seems to help with uh, dealing with potentially unobserved tasks that, that can be solved with few short learning. So here, ChatGPT learns a mapping between rap songs being egg and then grunge songs being banana. So that's pretty cool. I wanted to use excellent and bad, but unfortunately, I was overwritten. So obviously, some of that reinforcement learning and human feedback, um, this allows me from performing certain tasks. Um, but yeah, that's essentially how we've gotten from a very capable large language models to actually language models, which are assistants. So we need to train on code. We need to do instruction fine tuning. We put, potentially need some reinforcement learning in, in there as well. But that's how we can go from something that's just a la large language model, something that just completes text, to something that can actually follow instructions. Um, so the next sort of section of my slides is about the sort of reality and the business side of things. I like talking about business, so I thought that would be quite good. So obviously, so far, my talk has been quite researchy, so I thought 
let's talk about the sort of applications that leverage some of these techniques. So as you can see, the application landscape is growing. Um, I think there is obviously uh, plenty of applications which are um, founded upon the text um, uh, large language models. So we have obviously Microsoft suite of tools, email auto completion. We have the same about GitHub Copilot with code. My favorite application, unfortunately, is no longer available. It allowed me to create a Drake song from any, any text. So it was a, an example of a text to audio model. But obviously, that had some sort of copyright problems. So obviously, that no longer exists. Uh, but the application is definitely, uh, the application landscape is certainly growing, which is great. And actually, McKinsey, one of the big consultancies, believed that there is an entire value chain which sort of emerged very quickly. And for anyone that would like to enter this market, obviously entering at the sort of bottom level of hardware level, it's probably going to be tricky. It will be very tricky to compete against NVIDIA or uh, a Taiwanese um, semiconductor chip uh, company. But there's definitely quite a lot of opportunity to develop applications or develop services uh, around uh, that technology. Um, obviously, for me, I think that would be great. I think there will be plenty of money in upskilling for, for Gen AI. So I'm very excited. And in terms of how most people could leverage Gen AI in your organizations, I think there are typically five key technical pathways to do so. Uh, some of them are more accessible than the others. So typically, you could obviously try to train your model from scratch. But unless you have access to billions and billions of pounds, that's probably not the best option. The second option would be to perhaps adapt uh, an, an open source model in-house. And then I think the next uh, points, so three to five, are sort of the most plausible for most. It's to either build software layers in an open source model API or a closed source model API, or use software as a service tool, so something like a co-pilot. I think it's important to ensure that we know what are the repercussions of using closed source models. So obviously, typically, you don't want to give up too much of your data to a data center in California. So I would definitely encourage businesses to sort of focus on points two and three and use open source where possible. Uh, I think it's also important to use this stuff responsibly. So I think there are obviously a variety of different dimensions. One of them is trustworthiness. So is a model fair? Is a model secure? That sort of stuff is quite important. There's obviously a lot of legal repercussions of using this stuff. Um, in terms of intellectual property, I think this field is definitely something that's a bit of a minefield. In terms of regulation, we're still at a very early stages. People don't really know what to do in terms of regulation. Uh, another important thing is to um, consider the impact of some of these technology on the workers. So in my view, I think the focus should be on augmentation of the worker with these tools rather than automating the worker. And some people are also concerned about the environmental impact of these technologies. So that needs to be factored in into any sort of business um, strategy. And then I just wanted to conclude by thinking about the future and what could be the next steps. So at the minute, there is a lot of research which goes into leveraging large language models to use tools. So to use things like Google, use things like Wolfram Alpha. That seems to definitely decrease the amount of hallucination that these models do. But also some people think that that could be the new way of interacting with the internet. So rather than, for example, booking my own flights, which I don't do, thankfully I have my girlfriend to do it for me, um, there is a possibility that we'll be able to use and interact with a large language model to do tasks like this. Another thing that people are quite excited is actually incorporating more knowledge into these models, so actually making them more multimodal. So the minute they typically leverage text and maybe perhaps image data, and there are now attempts to create models which actually learn from more, so like 3D sensors, 
video, audio, because that's meant to replicate how humans learn. So we don't just learn from text. We learn from physical experience. We learn about the world with interacting with the world. And I think another thing that's very important to consider is how do you actually prevent from creation of monopolies? At the minute, OpenAI is probably one of the biggest players that would like to definitely position themselves as a sort of number one. Do we think that's the best thing? Probably not. Do we need to support open source community as much as we can? Probably yes. So yeah, there's lots of things happening. There's lots of moving parts. Things are obviously shifting at a very rapid pace. So it's very difficult to speculate where the future goes. But I definitely think we need to consider some of these things. And as I sort of mentioned in the sort of previous slide about using uh, these technologies um, responsibly, we need to think about the sort of regulatory uh, side of things as well. And I think that's me. So thank you so much for your attention. It's much appreciated. Okay, thanks to Mac for that real tour de force across, uh, across generative AI and uh, some glimpses into the home life of, of Mac and Emily as well thrown, thrown in. Um, so now it's a pleasure to move on to the panel session and for that we're delighted to have Hannah Underwood who's going to chair the panel. So Hannah's going to introduce herself. So, uh... Hello everyone. Well, what a delight it is to uh, chair the panel today. I'm just going to quickly introduce myself and then we'll get the panellists up on stage and they can each give you uh, a few minutes about uh, their views and hopefully prompt you thinking about some different questions. Um, so yeah, I'm Hannah Underwood. I am a recovering charity CEO. <laughs> um, it has been uh, one year since my last position and uh, I've spent the last, the last year um, helping charities and corporate foundations and funders think about how they can use data uh, more effectively to understand the impact that they create. And then in January, Callum, who's there on the front, uh, together we have um, uh, set up a, a company called Insightano, and we're trying to provide data engineering and no-code visualization tools to the charity sector to enable them uh, to take, make use of all of this amazing technology, and usually they let, get left behind as a sector. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I would like to invite my panellists to come up and sit down and, um, and then we will, we, we will, uh, I will briefly explain to you the rules about how to ask questions as well. Let me just move the slide over. So we're going to use something called Slido. There, there is a... Um, Slido. Oh, here we go. So Slido.com. So if you want to go onto that website, then you can use the code 3752561. And that's a way for you to submit your questions. If you um, want your question to be directed at a specific panel member, it would be really helpful if you could put that on. And then we could make sure that we've got the right people answering it. And also, if you'd like to ask your question yourself, then just pop your name on there. And then we've got a sort of cube mic that we can throw out to you. And uh, oh, and a, a real handheld one there um, so that you can ask your question in person. And so I'll do my best to, to field the questions. Um, but first of all, I'm, we're going to go through our panellists. And if you could each introduce yourselves in turn, spend a couple of minutes explaining your viewpoints, and then that might prompt some questions. So over to you, Christy. Um, hi. Thanks for having me here. I am Chrissy Cusley, and I work in language and cognition here at Newcastle University, um, situated in linguistics. So uh, I don't necessarily do data science per se, but I work more with humans and understanding how humans work. Um, my work is really in the evolution of language in the sense of you know, why we have this large, complex, open-ended communication system that no other species seems to have. Um, so my interest in AI is really using that as kind of a comparison to how, human work, how humans work, how, how this is sort of a, a moment of convergent evolution for us, if you will. So if you think about um, lots of other sort of leaps in technology and history, uh, like the invention of flight, you know, the, the people who were engineering that were looking to models, um, organic models of, you know, birds, right? Um, and that's not necessarily what we're doing with AI. Um, number one, because we don't fully understand how humans do all the complicated things we do. Um, but also because we only really have 
one data point, right? Humans are sort of the only species that has evolved this thing. Um, and we, we don't, we can't look across, you know, birds and insects and flying mammals and see what they have in common to kind of engineer this thing. Um, so yeah, that's sort of where I'm coming from. And I guess a lot of my interest is in how we can use AI to be able to do things that are intelligent, but are things that humans aren't necessarily good at. Um, I think the example of an assistant was a good one, actually, because we, you know, not everyone is very good at being an assistant, right? It's a skilled profession, and it's something that um, it's difficult for us to scale as humans because it's not something everything, everyone can do well or necessarily wants to do. So how can we use these systems and particularly sort of the generative, open-ended nature of language um, in order to understand how we can um, really get AI to work for humans um, in a useful way. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Colin? Yeah. Hi, I'm Colin Eberhardt. I'm the CTO of Scott Logic, a software consultancy. There's about 150 of us in the building just next door and about 600 across the UK. Um, I just want to say four things about generative AI. Two that I think have shaped the present and two that I think are going to shape the future. Now, Mac touched on some of these in, in his talk. So the first that shaped the present is these are general purpose tools now. You mentioned foundational models. Uh, previously, if you wanted to apply AI, you had to have a bunch of data scientists doing a bunch of training and modeling. You now have general purpose models that will uh, allow you to do a wide range of things without any of the training, which is pretty amazing. The second amazing thing is they operate via natural language. Previously, you needed a bunch of Python developers to help you use these tools. Now you can communicate to them in text. These two combined is what made ChatGPT such a runaway success. And if that was the end of the story, that would still be a fantastic story. But the two things that I think are going to shape the future are, one, again, Mac pointed, um, touched on this in his talk, reasoning. This is a relatively new discovery in around about the last six months that we can coach these models through prompt engineering, through chain of reasoning, to reason and solve problems, which is, again, pretty astonishing. And to your point, we don't understand the human brain. We don't actually understand how these models perform reasoning or do much of what they currently do. The other thing, they can now use tools. They can search the internet. They can write their own computer programs, execute them, and tell you the answer that they have just derived themselves. They can use a computer, and the computer was one of the most fantastic tools that we ever created to support us. Now these large language models are using computers to superpower them. And these two in combination, reasoning and the use of tools, if you take a step back, those two in combination are what elevated the human species above many of the other species that are around us, apart from cats, they're way smarter. <laughs> these, these AI models now possess the capabilities that elevated our human species, which is amazing and terrifying in equal combination. I think the two of those mean that we are on the cusp of, the, of probably one of the next technology epochs. And the way I define that is, in 10 years' time, I think we'll find it very hard to, to understand how we lived in a world before AI. I talk, I've got teenage kids. Talk, talk to them and try to explain to them life before the internet, and they don't get it. Is it how did you find stuff? Oh, it looked in books book what's a book I've seen a, I've seen a Kindle and is, is, is that it no no they're things that sit on a shelf with paper I don't get it I, I think in 10 years time AI is going to feel as alien to people as the as life before the internet feels to our, our teenagers yeah exciting very good Great. David. how can I follow that so um, I'm David Kennedy I'm the Dean for Digital Education at Newcastle um, I started out in Newcastle Ooh, 2000s, I became the Programme Director of Medicine, Deputy Head of Medicine. I then became a Deputy Dean for Education, and then the pandemic hit. Uh, I got this new role, end of 22, and uh, AI hit. It wasn't in the job description, but it's <laughs> fallen on me a bit. So I, I guess its kind of impact on higher education has been well publicised in the media, particularly around the fear around assessments and how students may use it. Um, and you know what, there is a bit of that, but I think we've also got to think about how we can use AI in a positive way um, in our education, mostly because they're going to have to use it in the future in the workplace. So I, again, I would say we're in a bit of a funny position where we don't know all the answers. We can't know all the answers yet, 
um, but I'm trying to persuade colleagues not to just focus on the, the kind of problems and the things we'll have to change around assessments and so on, but also the opportunities that AI can bring. Thank you. Kirsten? Hello, I'm Kirsten Edmondson. I'm um, a consultant in digital transformation. I've been um, working in digital since the early 90s and, um, and then moved on to mobile and, and so on. But in my spare time, I am an advocate for neurodiversity, particularly um, encouraging uh, employers and companies to hire more neurodiverse talent and retain it in their organisations. And I have a special interest in special education uh, needs. My son is uh, on the autistic spectrum and goes to a special school, and I'm a governor for a special school. So um, I'm interested in, a, in AI from a sort of a geeky perspective, because it's amazing technology, and it's um, in part terrifying and amazing. Um, I'm worried about it for, as a parent. I'm worried about it and what it will mean for my children's lives. And I'm particularly um, interested in um, how my son, who has autism, is going to cope with um, understanding that he's not talking to a human being because they are the, the, the language capabilities are such that. Um, he can be fooled into thinking that it's um, that he's talking to a human being. So I'm quite interested in how we how we understand that um, they are fallible and they're not necessarily telling us something that's correct and accurate. But on a positive note, so on this panel, I'm interested in how we can use AI technology for good. How can we improve um, the lives of overworked NHS staff and special educational needs teachers for the diagnostic process and deal with huge backlogs? How can we improve outcomes for children with special educational needs or anyone with additional needs? Um, so I'd hopefully like to have a positive spin on some of the apocalyptic <laughs> <laughs> uh, predictions. And that's me. We have a few ap apocalyptic questions yeah. going through as well. Yeah. Pat, was there anything that you wanted to add before we opened up to uh, questions? No, I think that's it, really. Uh, I'm just here for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sp speaking of riding, I, I definitely don't want to be the last horse dealer in Detroit. <laughs> so uh, someone did ask a question here about how fantastic your shirt was and where you got it from. But I <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we've got some great questions coming through. Also, if people don't have a question yourself, there's, um, if you like a question that's already on there, um, then it'll rise to the top and it's more likely to be, to be asked. So um, you can participate in that way even if you don't, you don't have a question yourself. Um, so we've got quite a lot of specific questions here, but I'll just start us with like a, a more open one. We've got a really great diverse range of opinions here. And so this isn't directed at anyone in particular. Um, so recent advances in AI have been impressive, specifically uh, the language models. But do you believe that we are on the road to artificial general intelligence? Or is that, is that just a diversion? Would anyone like to start with that one? Colin, you took a big intake of breath there. It looks like you've maybe got a view you'd like to one share. Of, one of the challenges we have is that we don't have a terribly good definition of intelligence in the first place. I think we're on a road to... Um, a, a form of artificial intelligence which is far more powerful than we have ever been able to imagine in the past. Is that AGI, artificial general, general intelligence? I think that's somewhat irrelevant. I, I think whether or not it meets that definition, I'm not interested. I think it will do things that we could simply not imagine. Yeah. And that's what matters. Yeah. I think I agree. We just don't have a definition for general intelligence, especially as you start to move into the human focus sciences, the word intelligence means something very specific. It's measured in a very specific way. It has a very thorny history of racism and colonialism tied with it. It's a very you know, different thing to talk about human intelligence. Um, and even if we start to look across species, you know, would we want to say that a dog doesn't have some kind of general intelligence? I mean, I think I know people who do research with social cognition in dogs, and they would say that maybe they do. So it's sort of a it's a weird buzz term that doesn't necessarily have a definition and maybe some of the data people, I'm not sure what, like what are the benchmarks more specifically? Uh, yeah, to be fair, I, I think 
uh, as Colin mentioned, we don't have a definition of AGI, but to me, an AGI has to be a system which perceives a variety of different things and takes a variety of different stimuli. So at the minute, obviously, the focus has been largely on developing text models. Um, and I think the way we perceive the world is through a variety of different modalities. So I think we're still quite far away from having an AGI which can experience different modalities and can learn by interacting with the physical world. Yeah, I think we're asking the wrong, wrong question here. Yeah. We're not going to reach a date where we say, we've done it. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. There's so many realms of unknowns <laughs> yeah. that we couldn't we could possibly define it. Yeah. OK, well, I'll move to um, uh, some of the questions. The most popular one that's rising to the list here is, how do we ensure that small companies without large capital don't let get, be get left behind? Um, and I'm particularly interested in that from the sort of charitable side as well, because I think that, you know, that, that there's the risk that the whole social sector could get left behind as well. Yeah, and I think that's why it's so important to sort of really support the open source community. Yeah. I think in order for smaller businesses to really take advantage of Gen AI, we need to have op models which are open source and free to use. I think yeah, okay. I'll build on that. It's too important a technology for it to be a closed technology. Yeah. And thankfully, um, open source models have progressed at an astonishing pace and are start starting to, to exceed the capabilities of commercial models. A again, you need to be quite techy to use some of these things, but you can now do on your laptop some pretty amazing things that you would have had to have relied on OpenAI or Microsoft to do. So thankfully, I, I completely agree, and we're, we're almost there already. I feel like this is a, it's a different question, but in some way it's kind of related. Um, so are entire job functions in danger of being phased out by generative AI, or is this just scaremongering? And I suppose I'll sort of preface that with then, does this... Does AI, do you think, offer an alternative rather than this sort of scary future, thinking about how it could augment um, careers and create new opportunities within all sizes of businesses? So I, I think, obviously, for a plumber, I think you're safe. So obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm Polish and I'm thinking of retraining. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think there is obviously a lot of jobs which um, rely on generating new content. And I think these jobs may potentially change a bit, but I don't necessarily think they will be completely replaced. I, I think it will be a matter of giving the workers the right tools to increase their productivity. And I think, if anything, that's quite an exciting thing. I think we will see probably considerable increases in productivity for a variety of different people. So I don't necessarily think people should be worried about being automated anytime soon. I think there was a cool quote from back in the day which says, you shouldn't be worried about getting your job automated, but you should be worried about losing your job to a person that knows how to leverage these tools. Yeah. So I think it's important to educate the workers. I think it's important to empower them to use these tools to understand them so that they can then use them in, in their day-to-day -day basis. David, are you thinking about teaching methodologies to yeah. prepare people for the, your students for the, for the world that they will be facing once they graduate? Yeah, so, sort of. I guess the question is, what will that look like? But I was just going to say the same kind of quote, so that it's, it's really about um, enhancing productivity, and it's not AI replacing jobs per se, although it may replace some, but it will change <coughs> what we do or how we go about our job. And, and that's really what we've got to train our graduates to be able to go into in the future. Kirsten, just, you look like you were, well, you just, were uh, gagging to say something. <laughs> just as a slight counter to that, so there's been lots of news about layoffs and layoffs linked directly to bringing in um, this type of automation. So I agree with both of what the panellists have said. Um, and I think a little bit about, you know, um, uh, when the web came out back in the 90s, it was like, well, libraries are dead and travel agents are dead and all of these things. And, and those industries have evolved and now they use those tools. I think it partly depends on, um, on how we deploy them. So there will be businesses who, and there will be organisations who, who is 
purely and only focused on, say, shareholder value and profit. And therefore, if you can get rid of, in your insurance company, um, the group of people who were calculating the statistical probability of X happening and you can replace it with a system like this, then you probably will. If your um, organisation is driven by profit, but also by, you know, um, social responsibility and creating a great place to work and all those things, then you would use those tools to augment. Because let's face it, in all the jobs we've got, people have got the boring bits that they don't want to do and the repetitive grunt work and, and so on. And um, in my transformation work, the way I've always explained it is the machine should be carrying the weight and freeing the human beings up to do the bits that only the human beings can do in adding that value not doing the low-level repetitive work that a machine can do really well. So I think if we're conscious about the deployment, it can be a really transformative and uh, uh, step forward, and it can enhance what we're doing. But I, that's I, our choice. I, I, I agree with you very much in general, but I think there's something that's happened quite recently where... I think there have been ethical mistakes made already. Uh, I know in your presentation, Mac, you had a number of images from Stable Diffusion. Now, Stable Diffusion and DALI, the image generation models, have been trained on a vast data set of images, a number of which are copyright. And the big tech companies behind that have been using the rather loose definition of fair use to their advantage in that training uh, uh, regime. Now, there are quite a significant number of the new images that are now appearing on stock photography websites are AI-generated. It's, it's creeping up. It's now around about 20% of stock imagery is now AI-generated. And money is now being taken away from the individuals who created the stock images that were then used to train the model. So I, I agree about that, that in a lot of uh, areas, certain parts of your job will be more exposed to automation in general. There are pockets that I think have already, ethical mistakes have been made and people are losing their livelihood right now in certain areas. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two, there's like the short view and the long view here. I think with any, like you were saying about the internet in the 90s with any technology, there's going to be short term tumult, but it's, it's about how it settles down in the long term. And there is something about this that the, the general sort of thing is not necessarily what AI can do that's impressive, but what it can do that, like Kirsten said, it's going to free up human time to allow us to push more creatively. And that sort of, that goes way back, right? It's us sort of living in groups and hunting together that freed up time for us to be able to make better tools and, and push forward. And that, that story goes a long way back. Um, so I think that there's short-term tumult that we have to keep a really close eye on, but you know, the long view can be good if we do that well. Unfortunately, the forces of capitalism don't necessarily lead to that conclusion. And I think ethically, morally, we have, we have to push in that direction. Otherwise, it, I don't necessarily re uh, think we'll reach that. I agree, and I think that's why it's about choice. We have to be, be, be making the conscious choices about it now, and we have to be talking about the conscious choices and we have to be holding the organisations to account in the way that, you know, as communities have started to in greenwashing or in LGBTQ washing or, you know, all of the, the things that are currently high on the agenda. So if you, you know, um, BP's latest ads or was it Shell's latest ads have just been pulled because they're factually misleading because they're saying, hey, we're great at green energy and there's no problem here. Don't, you know, don't look at all have a many billion profits and the fact that we're destroying ecosystems. Um, but there has to be that conversation and there has to be a, a push for account, you know, for, to hold these organisations to account. There's a slight, um, a, Colin, a, a question for you, Colin, that's um, a slight extension to this, um, but specifically for Scott Logic. <laughs> so, is this, uh, so do you think that Scott Logic will ever get to a point of being able to use AI to write code? Reducing the time to deliver the or, or time for delivery or the quantity of the developers that that, that you employ. Yes, uh, no to the last bit. Yes to the first bit. We're using it right now. I've been using Copilot since it was in preview. So Copilot, just for reference, 
is similar to a large language model, but it's trained on, on code. It's a fantastic and useful tool. And one of the things that we are doing is um, taking a critical look at all of the various aspects of our jobs at the moment and looking at the exposure to automation. So when I hear people talking about, oh, that job's going to be made redundant, that job's going to be made, made redundant, I think that's too black and white. There are jobs where more of the tasks you undertake are exposed to automation. And it's interesting you make the point about plumbers. It, who would have thought that, you know, in the Industrial Revolution, it was, it was the, the manual labourers who, who lost their jobs. In the AI Revolution, it's people like me who could be losing <laughs> our jobs. But no, we are, we are actively um, uh, investigating how we can uh, supercharge our capabilities with, with AI. To, to your point, that great quote, you're, if you don't do that, you're going to lose out to the people who are already doing that. Do we think we're going to end up with fewer people? No, we're just going to end up with more people being more awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's really good. So one that's risen to the top here, again, all anonymous, none of you. Oh, there's, there's another one coming up that I think we've got a real person going to ask a real question, but they're, they're still anonymous at the moment. Um, so this one's really popular. How will we know when new tools provide wrong answers? What's the danger when those answers go unnoticed and then get fed back into the learning mechanism? That's a very good question. And I think... If we were to use large language models, I think we have to probably accept that there will be some sort of level of hallucination. I mean, it probably always will be there. Uh, so if that's the case, I think the key is to have a human in the loop still. So I think we just need to have someone that sort of periodically checks things and ensures that hallucinations don't cause problems down the line. So it sort of goes back to the notion of, yeah, the sort of trustworthy AI. But yeah, I think in order to have a trustworthy AI system, we still need to have a human in the loop. I, th I think it's a problem that we should strive to solve, but I think there's a way of reframing it, and there's a different perspective here. We're, we're accepting of, of human errors and human failures, but we're not accepting of computer failures and errors. There's, there's the notion that computers are always right, I think maybe if we change our perspective and become accepting of, of computer systems sometimes being wrong, we may be able to better capitalise on the potential of AI. And don't ask me to describe how we might do that, <laughs> but um, it, 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 I came to this through talking to people who are wanting to use it in uh, call centres and things like that. I said, but what if it gets it wrong? I said, well, what if the people in your call centre get it wrong? I went, oh, yeah, humans get things wrong. <laughs> So how do you deal with that? What are your processes? What are your controls? Could you use those with AI? So I don't, I don't know. It's an interesting mm. angle. I think Very fair point. We, we just need to remember to keep teaching humans to be critical about this stuff. I mean, mm. in some sense, I don't think it's that different from Wikipedia, right? Like we tell, we tell our students, you can't necessarily trust that. Like do some critical thinking and double check and they should they should know to do the same thing about ChatGPT, which was trained on Wikipedia, right? So um, I think it's about just making sure humans remember that, yeah, this is just as fallible as like asking a friend. You would probably fact check that. So you should do it for AI too. Yeah, I don't think it's on one level that different to the amount of misinformation that's just available broadly on the internet, whether it's you know, COVID denial or, you know, who stole the US election or was it stolen? And, you know, there, there's a huge amount of misinformation which is consciously or unconsciously done. Um, I think that the, the, the real challenge for me is because it's natural language, um, it has the, it has, it feels like it has more authority. Uh, it feels like it ha you know, it has that kind of human quality to it. So therefore we, are less critical of it or more accepting of it because it feels more human. Um, yeah. But this next question that's risen to the top, which I love, and I'm glad it's risen to the top, specifically for you, Christine, but I feel that, like, that there's a link there too. Um, so this question is, um, humans understand what they say. Well, hopefully most of us do. <laughs> it depends what time of day it is, I suppose. But does generative AI understand what it says? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I, I can, to me, my answer to that is very quickly, I think, I think there might be different opinions here, so I do want to hear from others, but 
um, at least as I would understand the word understanding, no. So for, for us as humans, language points to things in the world. Um, for AI, it can't do that. It's, it's especially a large language model alone that has no multimodality to it is sort of, it's, it's a network of transition dependencies, right, of, of what word comes next. So it, and I use scare quotes, it knows, you know, what word to put next because it has this huge swath of data that's telling it what word is most likely next. All of the knowledge and understanding that it seems to have is in some sense our hallucination, right? It's what we're bringing <laughs> to the task because we understand what those things mean. But like when ChatGPT makes a joke, it's not trying to be funny. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's funny because we think it's funny. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're as humans doing a lot of the labor there and mostly, you know, this is a bag of words that are connected to each other, but they're not connected to anything in the world the way that words are for us. Um, so that might change a little bit as models get more multimodal, but I think that that's a ways off, personally. I'm going to be really annoying. You can tell I'm probably really, really <laughs> frustrating to work with, but I'm going to turn the question on its head. Does it matter? If, does it matter whether it understands? If it yields the result that resembles intelligence or yields a result that resembles reasoning, does it matter that it's just a statistical model? Who cares if it understands? Okay, the, the, I'm going to go to someone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we'll go to someone in the audience now. Who is Mr. D? You seem like you've. Oh, you're going to remain anonymous. Who is Mr. D? Maybe there's quite a few of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, shall I ask you a question, Mr. D? Yeah, okay. So in terms of hardware, how much, how much does it cost to train these kinds of LLMs, such as ChatGPT and Llama and others? How much energy would be required? It is a lot. So I think in order to train a large language model that has billions, if not trillions, of parameters, you need to have probably about 1,000 GPUs now. And you need to run those GPUs constant for at least three months. So that will be, first of all, a huge capital expenditure. I'm not sure what is the cost price for a single GPU unit, but yeah, it will be probably in the millions. And then obviously you need to factor in the electricity costs. So yeah, it is a lot, it's probably millions. Which is why foundational models are important. If exactly. you do it once and you've got a foundational model, yep. then you've got a return on your investment. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, let's go organic, a real hand. <laughs> Which ones is the please computed? I appreciate, you know, it takes a long time and costs a lot of money. But can, as a one-off, can you then... Oh, sorry. So once this has been computed, um, can you then serialise it and then download it to your laptop, like the index or something? Yes. Yep. And how big would that be? So it depends on, on the scale of these models, but it will be probably gigabytes. Okay, so it's feasible to download it to a normal laptop? Uh, with language. the smaller scale of these large language models, you'd be able to download and run inference probably on your laptop. Quite a lot of the research, the open source research at the moment has been how to compress yeah. some of these very large models to a size which is feasible to run on your machine yet yield remarkably similar results. So basically it's a yes, go onto GitHub, you can download this stuff and you can run it on your machine. I've, I've tried it myself, it's, it's a little bit slow, but the results are fantastic. So are any of the, like, the major models that we see, are they downloadable or are they just yeah, small yeah. models? Um, OpenAI, Open who are behind GPT-3, ChatGPT, uh, one of their models is the Whisper model. That's a, uh, a dictation. Uh, it's audio to, to text. And that's just a downloadable model on the internet. And it works very well. Your laptop gets rather hot, but it works very well. <laughs> And yeah, in terms of open source large language models, you'd be probably looking at something like a Bloom model, uh, which is uh, yeah, done by French researchers in Hug and Face. Uh, that allows you to essentially run that model and you can use it for any sort of commercial purposes as well. Uh, but yeah, there are other alternatives as well. So there's GPT Neo J or GPT Neo X Pythia. So th there are definitely options out there. 
It's worth noting, by the way, that Bloom is one of the ones that works with lots of languages fairly well, whereas a lot of these other things are pretty, have different performance in English than they have in a lot of other languages, yep. yeah. And we've got a question with the gentleman over there in the white, in the white shirt. <coughs> Sorry, I'm making you uh, earn, earn your money. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. I was wondering to ask about guardrails you want to see putting up to protect communities and society and democracy. Uh, I don't think we've done that for social media and we're reaping the consequences uh, for all the benefits of AI. I think those guardrails are really important. Yeah, that, that's definitely the case. I, I think, you know, obviously a lot of people would like to see uh, laws being put in place so that we don't end up in, in a situation like we had previously where we have monopolies. So I think anything that we have has to focus around breaking up any sort of monopolies and making sure that everyone has free and uh, open access to, to, to these tools. But I, on one point, I personally think it should be a legal requirement that any content generated by a model has to be labelled as AI generated. I think that's incredibly important. You, you made a point earlier about you know uh, some people uh, perhaps not being able to understand that it's AI generated. We're at a point where none of us are able to spot AI generated content, and it allows you to create vast quantities at a very low cost, which is incredibly dangerous. So whether it's images, whatever else, I think that should be law. It, it has to have some footnote. This is generated by AI. Mm. From my perspective, I think it will come down to how much external pressure governments are put under. So, on you know, at my four o'clock in the morning moment is you know this because it, it feels enormous. It feels too big. It's like climate change, or you know, and so it's so it can feel like as an individual or a small group of people, you know, this this technology is just going to happen whether we like it or not. So I think having the guardrails um, is really important, but I, and I think we've got a period within which to do it before the genie is completely out of the bottle and we're hurtling towards it. But it's about the public conversation and it's about the demand for action that the, the, that the public will have. I think open source is, um, is absolutely the right way to go. Labeling and being clear is absolutely the right way to go. And you know the Competition and Markets Commission have um, started to look at um, what it means because central government isn't going to look at it. But we have to create a demand for action, and if we don't, it will just stay with the corporations, and we'll end up in a William Gibson novel. For those of you who like science fiction. But the existential in threat, if I can cut in, of climate crisis. So governments have not been able to mitigate. No, they haven't. And you look at Just Stop Oil. Do we have, ad do we have uh, uh, demonstrations on moderate AI? So I think one thing to note is that climate change, I I'm not a climate scientist, but is a much bigger existential threat to humans than AI, hands down, no question. Um, the, the risks associated with AI are about things like misinformation, they're about misuse, um, you know, corporate ethics in some case, if, if we let, you know, corporations take control of this, it's not about Skynet. <laughs> um, I, I think that most people don't think that's coming. There's a lot of noise about that coming from a small number of people. Um, but so, so I think that the risks are a little bit more specific, but I think it's really important that any guardrails be top down and probably governmental from some organization that has social good in mind rather than profit. Um, and I think we need to be really careful about not devolving that and saying, oh, well, you know, different organizations can come up with their own different solutions because it, it won't work. It's too ad hoc. So it needs to be centralized and it needs to be sort of socially minded. We've got um, Kim in the audience who's been asking some fab questions, and you've got one that is sort of in this domain. Which is there anything you'd like to supplement? You can read it. Sort of you want, okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh gosh, I've made this. Uh, 
uh, too big. Right, so please talk about preventing the negative outcomes of from LLM use, such as accelerating inequality and increasing propaganda-esque manipulations by bad actors. So in the same sort of domain, but is there any sort of additional uh, comments or thoughts that panel members have? I, I still lean on... I, I, I do think it should be mandated that AI-generated content is labelled as such. I think not doing that is incredibly dangerous and it doesn't directly solve the issues that, that you, you reference but it mitigates to a certain extent. I don't think you can, you know, th there is, I don't think you can stop bad actors, you know, if someone wants to do something nefarious then, you know, then they'll do it and this is a great enabling technology but so is social media and there, there are lots of other things. Um, the, the question I'm kind of, I'm interested in is, um, so we know there's a huge amount of misinformation and misogyny and, you know, picanism um, in, in the information that these models are using to learn and we're training them on. So should there be a mandate, it's a question to answer your question, you know, should there be a mandate to clean up the data pool that we're using to train the models? Um, uh, I was listening to Professor Hannah Fry um, and she said that she was having an argument with ChatGPT because it wouldn't recognise that a woman could be a professor. Wow. Because, and she said, you know, we were having, I was, said I got really frustrated because I was actually arguing with the thing <laughs> because all of the examples of professors were men and it wouldn't give me a female example. And, but if you look on Wikipedia and you look on all those other things, uh, those other sources, the, the balance of women to men is ridiculous and that's just one measure. So if we can afford to spend the millions on these models, can't we afford to build some tools to rebalance the core data? I think and part of the problem is the genie's out of the bottle to a certain extent in that these models are now out there in the wild and we're hitting some issues that we find uncomfortable. Unfortunately, those are issues that haven't got solutions yet. It's almost like this technology has been rolled out a little bit sooner than it should. You, you mentioned hallucinations, the, the concept that, well, we've all seen it, that they get things wrong. There is no technical solution for that right now. The problem you're discussing there is, is known as alignment, to align a model to, to certain ethical values. That's not a solved problem, uh, uh, which is why we're in such an uncomfortable position. It's, uh, yeah, it's tricky. Oh, and they're reflecting problems yes. and, and biases that, that already exist yeah. within, within yeah. our world, and, don't and, they? And, yeah. <laughs> so there's probably never a good time to let the genie out of the yeah. bottle. I mean, it's a mirror, and maybe the reflection isn't as good <laughs> as we would like it to look. But I also think there's... Um, and maybe Mac can say more about this, but you know, there's some of the bigger models like GPT particularly, we don't necessarily have good detail about the training set and exactly what it was trained on um, and how those things were weighted, et cetera. So you know, there's an issue, that's why open source is so important because there's not transparency in, in some of these models where we can even go in and say, okay, you need to change this about the training set in order to recalibrate it so that it's not so misogynist or it's not so racist. Um, it, it's, there are some things that might be technically possible, but there are a lot that we can't do if it's closed source. Mm. Mm. And returning to a point, Colin, that you made earlier about the difficulty now in being able to tell has a response been created by a uh, Gen AI or a human? And um, there's a question here from Callum. Um, do you want to ask a question, Callum? Because I think it's quite interesting in connection to that. So it's a, it's, the question was, do we need a new Turing test? Right. <laughs> Do we need a new Turing test? So it's not probably the right nomenclature to ask, but when you're talking about if your son can detect if something is uh, AI, or is it labeled correctly? Is it actually labeled that this was generated using AI? We are very close to being able to generate like multimodal models that you would not be able to tell if it wasn't a real person talking to you. Do yeah. we need to have something around that so we can actually define whether or not that is something that's AI? Sadly, I think that's impossible. Uh, it, it, the, the current state of the art for detecting whether something is generated by an AI model is to train an AI model to spot whether something is create, has been generated by an AI model. <laughs> it, that, genuinely, that is the state of the art. 
And there are products that you can use that will tell you whether some text is AI generated. Uh, someone took some famous, I think it was like the US State of the Union speech and, and this tool predicted that it was 98%. Yeah. Oh no, was it the US Constitution? Something like 98% of the US Constitution was generated by AI or something like, like that. Uh, it's, it's just impossible, which is why, again, I, I you shouldn't leave the technologists to solve these problems. No, and I say that I, as a technologist. <laughs> yeah, I think this Don't is Don't leave it to us. This is a human <laughs> problem. I mean, part of, the, part of the problem with a technological solution is that it becomes an arms race, right? Like, as soon as you make yes. a tool that can detect it, then that becomes a target from the model, and then you need a new, new tool. So, so you're just going to get in an, a, a ratchet there that you don't want to get into. But I, I actually... I'm a little bit optimistic that with the right effort that we can get humans to be more skeptical in the right way. I think that there's, there's something about the hype that, that has people, you know, they're, they're drawn to this incredulity of like, oh my God, this is so impressive. But I think there actually hasn't been a lot of work doing sort of large scale experiments where if you tell people, you know, half of what you're going to see is AI and half of what you're going to see is from a real person about how well they actually do. I don't think they're going to get 100% on the AI, but it wouldn't surprise me if they do a little bit better than chance. Um, and how, how do we, you know, get that going and, and teach them to be more skeptical? And that might mean that, you know, you have to be skeptical about everything. <laughs> But I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure that that's the worst thing. I've got a question for you, Hannah. Oh. Have, we, have, we got, have we got any positive <laughs> questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, yeah, okay, so um, we, we're, we're hurtling towards the last 10 minutes, so I thought, um, I've got a question, it's a bit naughty, yes, my own question, but I think it might like, broaden the debate a little bit. Um, so, uh, to, I mean, it'd be nice if all of you, uh, ha, ha, you might have a different response each, but which other domains for generative AI beyond language models are catching your attention right now and why? So I think there's definitely some um, models out there that are now text to video. So I think this is the space that's growing. And I don't know whether you guys have managed to play with uh, Runway Gen 2. I did manage to play with it today. It was pretty cool. So I definitely think there will be uh, definitely models that allow you to create your own video content. I think that's going to happen in the not too far distant future. I think there's definitely work that's done to uh, obviously work on models that output audio. So I think we're going to be probably hearing more of that. And obviously, that's already been flagged up as a problem for things like Spotify. So yeah, I, I think these modalities are probably the ones that are going to be uh, experiencing similar boom to text-to-text -text models. Anyone else? Some cool stuff that you've uh, spotted? <laughs> yeah. Or are terrified by, but let's try and keep positive. <laughs> are you going? Or should I? Kirsten? No, no, oh, sorry. I'm, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Hands up who's got an Alexa or a home assistant, something like that. They're so dumb, aren't they? They really are stupid. How many times do you have to say the same thing for it to understand what you're doing? This is what I'm excited in. I think we are close to getting genuinely intelligent feeling home assistants rather than something that was sold to you as an intelligent home assistant but is as dumb as you can imagine. <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, in the very near future we'll be able to say, oh, I, I need to meet with... Uh, Sally, Frank, and Bob, uh, around about 10 o'clock, go, go away and sort that out. And your AI assistant will talk to their AI assistants, and, the, you know, you're, and it will work out where to meet, how to meet. Genuinely, I think we are that close to being able to do that. I don't know if people like Marvel films, Jarvis. That, that Jarvis, two years ago to me, was like science fiction. Jarvis now to me is something that I think we're going to see in two years' time. I'm more thinking Night Rider, to be honest. Night Rider, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, if we do get that, I'd like to give it a male voice, if possible, because that's a problem that voice assistants have. They tend to always have female voices, which is a whole, whole thing. <laughs> but, yeah. but you can pre-program Alexa. Yes, I've, you can. I, Ours is called Ziggy and speaks in an Irish accent now, which is a lot of fun. I always seem to be Australian. <laughs> yeah. <reason. laughs> David, do you have any? Uh, uh, no, I was going to say it was, the, it was the text audio, text to video. Um, it's quite, 
quite interesting. I know some some colleagues are looking at to to do podcasts that they just type up and it creates it for them. Um, so it, it's it, it's an exciting area. One that caught my, oh sorry go no, on no 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 I was just there's a lady there with her hand up. Oh. Oh, right, go for it, go for it, you ask it, Kim. <laughs> oh, I need to find it in the list now. Uh, Wade through say, the doom um, scroll. Could, could, we use, could we use LLMs as a way of building a true hive mind for next level democracy via aggregating knowledge and sentiments, opinions, preferences at a massive scale? Wow. Oh. <laughs> that sounds like a good research project. No, 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 that is a major <laughs> question, yeah. I don't. I think the risks are too great <laughs> just yeah, now, personally. Great. But yeah, I think humans aren't good at that yet. <laughs> so it's another one of those things where, like, do we have, do we have a good model that we could even adapt for how that would work? Um, I do think there are some cool ways that we could use the automation that AI affords us to maybe revolutionize democracy. I was reading a very cool article about how, what if. We reformed, you can hear I'm American, the tax system in the US so that instead of it being local, you know, you were pooled with 15,000 random other people and your money got pooled together. So we're decentralizing the way that interest works. It's no longer that your interest is in the streets just where you live, but it's all sort of distributed across the country. So I think there, there are definitely cool things that AI could do that in that space. But I'm not sure that I'd want LLMs in there precisely for the you can't tell when it's not human risk. At, at the moment, I think we should be concentrating on fun, what makes life interesting. And firstly, I like fun. Secondly, <laughs> the, the risk of error and the consequence of error is much lower when you're using it in fun applications. And until we solve some of the fundamental issues with it, I think we should just have fun. One awesome application <laughs> that I was, I, because I've been obviously journeying up on this on the more podcasts, uh, was the use of um, uh, analysing the human voice and uh, a technology that had been developed where just from a, f a sample of a human voice, they could recreate what your face looks like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then a sort of um, a subversion of that was then being able to diagnose disease, and particularly respiratory um, diseases, just from a vocal sample, which just completely blew my little mind. <laughs> Another, uh, I don't know if anyone follows Vic. Vic Reeves, no, Bob Mortimer, sorry, wrong, wrong one. He, he did this really fun thing called Train Guy on Twitter for a long time. It was really, really funny. He didn't do enough of them. I trained GPT on Train Guy so that it could create new episodes of his, <laughs> and it was brilliant. It was hilarious. <laughs> fun. So we're very close to our six o'clock stopping point, and we have oodles of questions. So this is obviously a topic that's, you know, it's not going on. Did, excuse me, sir. Oh, oh, we've got a, a final cheeky question over there. Thank you. Sorry. I, this isn't my field, so um, it's kind of an opinion question. I find this fascinating, but uh, I'm coming at this from a, the point of view of a biomedical scientist, and we have ethics on the use of animals for research. So my fellowship was funded by the NC3R's National Centre for the Replacement and Reduction and Refinement of Animals, and it's all based on the assumption that animals can feel pain and that they're conscious, and you haven't quite touched on the perspective of the AI here. I can see that you all think that these are tools and that there's no sort of consciousness involved, or maybe you do. I mean, are AI conscious, and do you think there's the possibility for them to become conscious, in which case is there gonna be a need to, because that has ethical implications, and like if it's conscious and it can feel then should we be regulating the use of these as effectively slaves? I mean, no. I, I just, I don't think there's any way it can be conscious. <laughs> this is dis disputable, you know, this is something we don't understand well in humans, again, necessarily, but I think that language and consciousness are certainly tightly tied, um, but many would argue that like, 
you know, it, the look, an LLM is text, which is a model of spoken language, which itself is a particular instantiation of a model of human experience that's entailed with cognition. So as you go down that chain, it's sort of lossy, right? Um, and I just don't think that something trained on a, even the most giant bag of words in the world is going to manifest consciousness. It's missing too many ingredients um, that humans have. As for what happens if you get to the more multimodal stuff, I'm not you know, entirely sure, but you know, we're not there yet. I don't think we should get our, let our anxiety get ahead of ourselves in this. So uh, as the probably um, the least awarded member of the panel, so I don't have a PhD, um, my layman's view is that no, not conscious. And I think that um, with the best will in the world, rather than focusing on, an ex, you know, on, on this question of the far, far, far future of what if, we should be thinking about the ethical considerations that are right in front of us in our everyday lives. You know, how we treat each other and how we treat people who are different to us. Uh, I absolutely agree. I think just maybe from the point of view that this technology seems to be increasing so quickly, we don't actually know what consciousness is. Yeah. That we don't know how humans are conscious. The only way that I can tell if you're conscious is by asking you. We can't ask animals whether they're conscious, which is why we need these, you know, we're making the assumption. It might not be that far in the future that AI is more complex than we can. We already don't understand how it works. So when it's getting more and more complex, is there a, you know, if, if consciousness is a product of complexity, then it will get to the stage where it is complex enough, then it will be as complex as the human brain. So either consciousness isn't a product of complexity, in which case they might be conscious already. I mean, I'm not sure it scales linearly with complexity. So already the number, yeah, yeah, the number of parameters that chat, that GPT-4 has exceeds, you know, the number of neurons that the human brain has. Now that's not to say that the number of neurons is necessarily the most relevant measure of the capacity of the human brain. Um, but, you know, I don't, I just think it's, I go, you know, back to this example of flight, it just doesn't work the same way and I don't think we can expect it to have the same emergent properties. So if we, you know, if the Wright brothers were looking at birds to make a plane, that's not what we're doing. We're looking at birds and making a hot air balloon, right? <laughs> It also flies, but it's just not the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree. The, the emergent reasoning capability of these models is a parlor trick, but it's a, sophistic, it's a sufficiently sophisticated par parlor trick that we're, we can capitalize it on it and use it for a whole s slew of interesting applications. But it is a trick. Uh, mm. Someone described them as stochastic parrots. Yeah. And that's exactly what they are. Yeah, that's Tim Nick Gebru and um, <laughs> yeah. Melissa Mitchell who, who were yeah. Google, yeah. They are statistical models. It's just what they can do is pretty amazing. Well, that seems like a perfect uh, <laughs> quote to end on. Um, would you like to join me in thanking our panelists this evening? <laughs> Well, thanks to Hannah and the panel. That was really excellent, really, really thoughtful. I made a lot of notes and that lots to, lots to think about. Um, and I'd also like to thank a few other people. So to Holly Johnson, who conceived the idea and pulled the panel, panel together. To Mac for his really excellent overview, which really set the scene and cut through the, through the hype. To Stuart for the AV, uh, and particularly to Georgia to Ellen and Alison for all their excellent organisation skills which made everything go smoothly, so really appreciate that. And finally, thanks to you for attending and asking such good questions either directly or on Slido, that really made a, made a difference. And so uh, we hope you want to continue the, the discussion. There's wine and beer and soft drinks outside, so please do join us if you can and uh, look forward to chatting to you outside. Thank you. <laughs>